PowerPoint decks, endless reports, forgotten dashboards, we've seen them kill momentum in supply chain meetings. In this section, we reveal how the best leaders use storytelling to turn complex data into clear, confident decisions and why this often seen as soft skill is fast becoming a hard requirement. And that's, I mean, like it's really interesting, uh, a large number of points we've covered. One that I find particularly appealing from my old military days is the importance of rehearsal. In fact, what we often say is that if there's insufficient time to plan, at least do a rehearsal so that everybody knows what they've got to do and where they've got to do it, because the last mile is considerably more important than the beautifully finessed uh, and uh, pointing and Pacific, Pacific uh, pointing at the various areas. Okay, so then if I drive in a little bit, though, uh, Sam, because one of the challenges that we actually face a lot when we're speaking to customers is that there's so much near real time, if not actually real time data available. So as a strategic leader, you you know you could log in and see exactly where that customer part is, or you could log in and listen to the call center uh, currently handling uh, a call with a, with a disgruntled consumer. And you can have near real time KPIs. So given the sheer amount of data that is available to you, how do you strike the balance between being able to separate out what are strategic decisions distinct from the sort of tactical level decisions that are happening all around you? So there, 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 I think there are two things there. Um, I don't know if you know the uh, the Pixar movie um, Up uh, about the the, the the old man who's a widower with his with his uh, with, with the young boy, and they fly in a house tethered by balloons. When they eventually land in Roy Rama in Venezuela, because it's a fantasy cartoon film, um, they meet a series of dogs, uh, and these dogs. Uh, have voice um, boxes on them that allow them to speak in, in, in English. Um, and there's one particularly dumb uh, dog called Doug, who's a Labrador. He's a very loyal, very nice dog. There's an evil Doberman, but there's a lovely dog called Doug. Um, and he's explaining about how he, he's able to speak. And after about 10 seconds, he suddenly says, Squirrel! Uh, squirrel! Anyone who's ever uh, taken a dog for a walk where there have been squirrels will know that. Now, leaders, I think, because there's a reason for me for me telling that that, that story about Doug. Um, uh, the problem with data is that data is generally in the past. Okay, uh, even if it's real time data, it's it and, and it's being used for predictive purposes. Data is it, data exists in the past tense, um, and yet you know now that our dashboards boards are able to, to take. Um, uh, those real-time feeds, and not just dashboards, but our, our, our analytics, our way of looking at the world is able to take real-time feeds. Um, it is possible to drop in in the middle of things and to say, ah, oh, yeah, exactly as you say, that we've got a really disgruntled customer. This is obviously, this is obviously an, uh, a terribly important problem. Oh my, that's the third person I've heard today complaining about the fact we haven't been, we haven't delivered on time in full. Um, what on earth are we going to do about this? We've clearly got a massive problem. Might be because there's a traffic jam or an oil spill or a, or a, or a protest on the motorway. Or it, it, there may be all sorts of reasons that just the raw live numbers are not able to explain. So I think we need to be less dug and less uh, reactive to uh, the instances, um, uh, the recent instances, less distracted by the now. We need to, we need to, um, in our data infrastructures, we need to uh, say, okay, you know, one alarm bell, we pay attention to every alarm bell that rings. Three alarm bells, uh, uh, it, it might well be serious. 30 alarm bells, we've got something structurally wrong. So it's about getting the right perspective between the past tense nature of data and balancing that with the real-time ability to see um, challenges as they face us uh, uh, in the office. But but be a bit less Doug. I mean, be as nice as Doug. Don't be as nasty as the Doberman. Um, but but to, to to balance the 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 what technology allows us with what common sense should really afford us. Yeah, I mean, I've I've now got a new phrase. Um, Sam, I'm going to start calling them data squirrels. Quite right. Uh, so, but you know, it's uh, you know, it is so true. Especially, I mean, as a as a, as a small medium uh, business owner myself, you know, I, there are so many things that pop up that you want to grab immediately because, in the end, it feels important and it feels urgent. And back to your point earlier about the psychology of these things, 
uh, those things that feel threatening, those things that feel very close to are going to result in that human emotional reaction to, uh, to get involved, uh, especially as the data is ever increasingly uh, more accurate. At right. One of the other things that we find uh, quite, quite tough though, is that whenever we are looking as executives, we also have lots of dashboards. And I often, I often refer to them as dashboards of crashed airplanes. And the reason why I do that is because a lot of people in supply chain talk about the notion of control towers. So, you know, more often than not, like you say, the data is in the past and therefore actually what you're doing is observing all of your failures in ever increasingly great levels of magnitude. So how do we help people so we get that notion of where, you know, we're being overwhelmed with data, we talked about that, but how do we help people move so that they're able to maybe get more decision support for the future? They're maybe able to better understand what predictability actually means. They're be able to better understand what statistically relevant means in a in a in a sort of more layman's term. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we you can't drive a car by looking in the rearview mirror, um, uh, and we need to. Uh, there's no there's, there's no point in doing any data analysis. I mean, unless we're, I guess, unless we're looking to to validate our bonus for the previous year um, uh, or the the company's bonus pool. There's there, there's no point just looking back. Um, so if we if we if we if we're building on a on a way of working, if we're building up a way of working from uh, the the, the quick the questions that you've asked so far. Um, clearly finding and using truly relevant data, not overwhelming, um, taking a long enough time series view that's able to iron out issues of season, or well, iron out or account for issues of seasonality. Oh my God, we've sold so much more at Christmas, I wonder, or in December, I wonder why that is. Um, uh, we sell nothing when it's really, really, you know, we don't, we don't sell any um, outdoor uh, 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 garden furniture when it's cold and wet. Yeah, sure. Right. There's some seasonality. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm giving banal examples, but but we, finding and using relevant data, not overwhelming with data, respecting the data tolerance uh, of the audience. Those th those all help. But as I say, you can't drive a car by just looking in the rearview mirror. We need then, based on individual corporate industry experience, to know what really are the most important signals? What are the signals that we can use, not just to correlate with future success, but to, to help us to predict that future success? Are they actually causal? As I say, we, we as a species, we want there to be these if and then contingencies. If I pull this lever, then this is likely to happen over here. More likely in a complex uh, business, particularly like supply chain, where you know physically, electronically, we've got all of this uh, uh, kind of information and physical, the physical stuff moving in and out. It's if I pull these three levers in this particular sequence, uh, tap dance, turn on that tap, and so on and so on. And they're multivariate. They're multivariate models. And the problem with multivariate models and the human mind is that we can only really, we can only really account, we can only really handle two or three way interactions. Now, if I go back to when I was a research psychologist and, um, you know, sometimes my analyses would throw out four and five way interactions because I have lots of different variables and you, we just can't understand what they are. So when we're looking not only do we need to be careful about uh, not overwhelming uh, uh, the audience, and I'll come back to the audience shortly, but no, not only do we need to be careful not to overwhelm the audience with too many data points, too much for them to hold in their working memory as they listen or read or consider the argument that you're making. We also need not to co-vary too many different variables. I'm trying not to be statistical. We need to build models that are not so complicated that it's impossible to understand them. Let's take an example. In 2015-16, Leicester City um, won the Premier League title in, in England. Um, and you may not be a football fan, but bear with me. Um, uh, it was really, really unexpected. It was the first time a team outside um, the so-called Big Six had won the title since it had, the league had come into existence in 1992. Um, uh, when an outlier did win it. Um, uh, it, it had just been shared amongst a few. Uh, and you kind of want to work out, well, you know, what was it that caused that? 
Was it the fact that they had a sprightly, seasoned Italian manager, Claudio Ranieri, who, the tinker man who was able to do things? Was it because they had so little possession? They only had 32% possession in, across the season. Was it because they had this whippet-like striker? Was it because the other the traditional big six for all of their different reasons were going through a slump. Was it the weather? Was it journalism? Was it Scott, the television deal? Was it the fact that Leicester, Leicester weren't playing in Europe and everybody else was? Yeah, it was probably all of those things, but how do you build a model that doesn't leave your head spinning? Um, uh, uh, because, you know, what we all want, particularly if we're challengers in a market, what we all want is to have our, our Leicester City moment. You know, we want to have a, 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 an ability to, to subvert the market. But if we try and build model, if we, if we use too much data and we try and build models that are too complicated, our audience's minds will be, will be reeling. I want to come back to audience because obviously I, I, I know, I've told you I've already I'm a stuck record on empathy and humanity and the respect for the data tolerance of the audience. I do a lot of training. I'm doing some this afternoon with a big, um, uh, the, 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 re the research team of a big uh, food uh, business. Um, uh, and whip smart, absolutely whip smart um, data analysts. The first exercise that we're going to be running through in this training on data storytelling is to get them to imagine a presentation that they need to make or imagine a meeting they need to be in and to characterize the audience that they are talking to. So it's a, it's a, it, it, there's, a, there's a, an FBI hostage negotiator called Chris Voss, who's written an excellent book called Never Split the Difference. Uh, and um, when you are an FBI hostage negotiator, it really is life and death, the way that you're dealing with data and the way that you're dealing with your audience. And he talks about the need to develop tactical empathy. Now, tactical empathy sounds cynical, but if you're dealing with a with, with a with a hostage, you know you never with a hostage taker, you're never going to be their best friend. But you need to ask them questions and get information from them in a way that makes it feel as though you understand what it's like to be there. And whenever we're building, first of all, reports, uh, second dashboards, third models that explain the future. Um, we need to put ourselves into the mind, the mindset, the shoes of those that we seek to influence. If we don't do that, we are destined to fail. Excuse that long answer. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, suite of answers, but again, far too much to uh, unpack, Sam. I'm going to be listening back to this uh, with quite with quite keenly, actually, especially you know, you've read up well areas or I never split the difference, one of my favorite, uh, favorite books uh, in, the, in the business market. Uh, not and surrounded by idiots for some reason, but certainly never split the difference uh, is a fantastic way to characterize uh, any negotiation and indeed any uh, presentation or even an email that you intend to write. Uh, fantastic, uh, a fantastic book. I like the idea though of again, trying to understand the audience. So I'm gonna put you on the spot here a bit and maybe even, uh, you know, some free consulting. So let's, let's see how we go with this. I'm a supply chain leader. I, I'm looking at a painful amount of data. I'm going to be walking into a cross-functional uh, team uh, comprising of your normal, your human resources, your uh, procurement teams, right through to the CEO, chief operations officer, etc. You know, is there is there a framework that I should be thinking about in order to try to distill all of the data that I've got in front of me into a you know, manageable, coherent story? Uh, so have a structure, absolutely have a structure, have a beginning, middle and then an end. Start with, start with the answer, give the answer straight away. Um, uh, we're here today to talk about the opportunity that uh, Bulgaria, Romania and Slovakia present to us. Uh, it's an untapped market and we believe that there is a 17 million, un there's a 17 million uh, uh, opportunity for the business there. So give the answer straight away. Now, when I say know your audience, it's, you know, some people uh, unfairly describe, because uh, marketing services has moved on a lot, but unfairly describe the marketing department as the colouring in department. Um, uh, and very often, uh, to this day, senior marketers, even if they are steeped in econ econometrics, very often they don't speak the language of the CEO and the CFO. Um, who are the ultimate decision makers. So you, you can make a choice. 
you can make a choice and think, right, I'm going to pitch this and I'm going to pitch the, the data I use and the language I use around the data at the people that matter in the room. And yet, and yet, so the CEO and the CFO, let's, let, let's, say, let's say they happen to be there. And yet HR and, uh, and marketing and, uh, and supply chain may feel left out or excluded. Because if you pitch the language just to a couple of decision makers in the room and you ignore a half a dozen other people, uh, in your language, in your choice of data, you won't look at the HR function. You won't engage. You'll be talking because you, because you'll think there'll be that cynical, I guess, that cynical view that um, well, you know, the other people don't matter. They're just here to, to keep the seats warm and eat the biscuits, um, even if it's on Teams or Zoom. Uh, so um, you can, you could you could do that. Uh, who, you could do that, and that might be smart for your own advancement and for and, and to get decision makers um, uh, but I I mean another approach you can take is to average out uh, this is a rough and ready approach but to average out the the likely data tolerance in the room um, to think okay everybody has a lot of data uh, we need some evidence here, but we we we, we mustn't be uh, we mustn't be truly overwhelming. And to think, okay, well maybe you know HR is a function that is increasingly using data. Let's let's put ourselves into the mind of the uh, of the of the the head of people who's in the room and pitch it at them. And maybe we'll get, we'd go up a bit for the CEO, CFO. We'd go down a bit for the for head of marketing. I, I think that has the challenge. Um, it has a real challenge of uh, making it kind of so bland that it doesn't appeal to anybody. Um, so I think um, ultimately uh, I would say give the answer away immediately. Uh, don't show your workings out. Don't use irrelevant data. Don't sh don't take the uh, audience on the journey that you that you have taken to get there. However, do say, I realize that this Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, if those are my three countries, um, I, I realize that, this, that, 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 the, that, that there's a lot that everybody in the room doesn't know. We have spent the last three months looking at this opportunity. And although I've only got five slides or six pages or whatever it might be, although I've only, uh, although I've only shared the top line, rest assured, we've got an appendix of 162 slides that goes through town by town, market by market, um, uh, distribution mechanism by distribution mechanism. If you want to drill down into the data, I can spend all afternoon with you. And my view is that if you, if you say, this is the summary and there's more behind it, different, different individuals in the room will want to d dive deep with you. They will, want, they, they will feel encouraged because they understand what the story is, the 17 million opportunity. Um, they and they will be reassured that if they want to know how the sausage is made, you can show them all of the pieces that go into it. Um, so it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a dance of the seven veils, but I think that's probably better than making it so bland that it that it, it appeals to the lowest common denominator. But give your answer away first. Don't lead up to the answer. You're not writing EastEnders, you know. Uh, make sure you, you don't want a dum dum moment. You want you want that to be right at the top. Start with start with the answer. So storytelling isn't a nice to have. It's a secret weapon for supply chain leaders who want to turn insights into action. But how do you embed that thinking across your entire organization? In the third part, we're talking about building a no malarkey culture where communication, empathy, and smart use of data become the norm, not the exception.